Uh, thanks very much. Thanks, thanks, Rosanna. Thanks everyone for um, inviting us. Um, so this is Yael, my wife and a studio partner. We met in college uh, and then um, somehow uh, we still work together. We have kids and a dog. Um, and um, yeah, um, do I see the next slide or I just need to remember uh, what I prepared two weeks ago? Anyway, um, so um, we're based in London for nearly about 20 years. Uh, we design products. Um, um, uh, we collaborate with brands like Establishing Sun, uh, Arco, um, La Salle, uh, Louis Vuitton. Uh, you will show some products on the way. We try to challenge um, movements. We like to come up with new uh, typologies. Um, this is a chair we um, developed for Danish brand Plus Ale, which is a combination of an armchair and a desk. So you can use the white surface either to eat or to walk while you're on the move in airport or libraries. And this maybe you don't see, but the seat is actually quadrat textile. I'm gonna point out every time we see a, a quadrat textile in this presentation. Um, Louis Vuitton, it's leather, so sorry, but there are more coming. Um, uh, we develop also um, carpets, surfaces, kitchen. This is IKEA kitchen with, it's actually a IKEA hacked kitchen. So the front is made by a Swedish brand Superfront, which sits on IKEA uh, best um, cabinet. Um, we also developed during COVID this um, platform for modular sofa where a customer can order online a modular sofa where can just change the jackets and keep the same base, but by, by changing the um, jackets, you can um, keep the sofa for longer time and also help a cons consumer with the um, basically keeping the product for a longer time, but um, yeah, helping the company, sorry, to uh, uh, reduce stock. Um, we develop surfaces, tiles, uh, installation, concept installation for brands, um, interior details. This is a shop we developed for Stella McCartney uh, quite some time ago. Uh, we do museum exhibitions. Uh, this is the Vitra Design Museum in um, Germany. And stand, again, quadrat. That's, I think, about 10 years ago. Uh, um, yeah, this is yeah, Yael and me. Well, I mean, we love play with material. We love play with processes. Um, and I think what we really aiming is to go through experimental method, but always we try to conclude it in a product that uh, people can enjoy. We see ourselves designers in the sense that we don't want to finish just with a, an abstract uh, experiment. We really like it to push it to a consumable uh, product. So it's all started uh, when we um, learn at the RCA, where for two years at the time, Ron Arad was the head of the course, all you need to do is almost like a self-meditation and think what you are interested in. What was your core interest? What your dream? What you want to spend the rest of your life on as a creative person? So, um, Yael, interest always was connected to turning flat material into three-dimensional forms. So everything she did was about taking paper or fabric or sheets of plastic and by manipulating them and creating patterns and folding them, creating <clears throat> those three dimensional shapes. So for instance, the milk bottles, which you see here, is a representation of the fat percentage. So the lower fat is the skinny bottle, the higher fat is the fat bottles. Um, the, the skirt, what she called evacuation skirt, <clears throat> was at a time where there was the Katrina storm in the States, which was quite a disaster. And in your imagination was a story where people are having parties on the beach, but then uh, if something um, 
it's a nami can you just inflate and it's become a canoe obviously quite um uh, humoristic but at the same time in her perspective the ability to turn a, a normal looking skirt into inflatable canoe that that was the missions and again a biblical story of uh, I told you, yeah, it was a murderess in the Bible. So here, uh, there is a famous story of a of a female murderer that uh, chopping. I can't remember the the male uh, name. Chopping is it? Yeah, and um, that was uh, a concept for the portrait gallery um, for the gift shop in London. Um, on my case, I was interested in movement, in playful. My dissertation was based about how products looks in animation. Because if you think about animation, there are no constraints. Um, for an animator to draw a person going on a street or walking on the clouds, it's exactly the same effort. So by the fact that they fit graffiti or they fit anything to do with our reality, they really open for endless ideas and imagination. And I thought, how can I take this freedom and bring it to reality? So I designed uh, elements that play with gravity. Say this is a, was a rotating wall where it react to the movement or a fish tank where while they move, the different vessels bring oxygen to the fish. Or this uh, bear that at uh, the bin bag that looks like a teddy bear came from a concept where in London, you wherever you go, you always see a rubbish bag on the street because every council collects the uh, rubbish in different days. And it's really confusing. Most of the residents don't know exactly when they're supposed to put the rubbish outside. So you end up walking in the street and there's always see rubbish bags everywhere. And I thought, if those rubbish bags would have been designed like teddy bears, at least you would see teddy bear sittings in the different corner, which would be. Um, so this, this, this was my research of how you bring some humor, some surprise to product design. But then was the problem is that we graduated two years after playing with our heads and we couldn't find job. We didn't have any money. And like, how can you find a job with this kind of portfolio? <laughs> so luckily we've been invited to do a project here in China, in Xiamen. Uh, we had a friend, he had to develop a, uh, a new collection for an umbrellas brand that wanted to expand into luggage. So Yel and I joined them. It's the first time we actually worked together. And we were like for four months trying to convince this uh, investor to design luggage that are not slick. They don't look like so clean and to have some raw edges. So we thought, let's do something with felt. Let's do something with leather. It's material that you don't have to treat the edge. You can just leave it raw. So for four months, that was the discussion. And nothing came out from this project. But at least when we got back to London, we decided, yeah, we should keep working as a team. And we already had a name because for four months, we kept saying raw edges. So somehow we stuck with this name. So, I mean, really, the, the mission of us is to take our qualities, our interests about playful, experimental approach, uh, and to try to make it more commercial. I mean, when we graduated, obviously, like, I guess many of you young designers or um, just a recent graduate, you, you come up to the world and the industry is kind of rolling and evolving and you think, how can you make, how you can add to it? There is so much going on. Everything is so brilliant and beautiful. How do you find your little place in whatever happening? How you can add something, how you can renew? And that was something that we kind of, um, spend some time thinking, how can we take our interests and qualities and develop uh, products? Um, so as I said, we did, um, we designed products, uh, unique pieces that we develop in the studio uh, individually and space installation. This is again, quadrant. Um, um, we uh, experiment with material, uh, we like to create new topologies. We try to have something inventive in the, in the structure or in the process of production, or the way people use our products. Uh, we play a lot with geometry, uh, pattern making. So that's, that's, that's roughly our interest movement. And um, this is our studio. We see our studio as like a playground for experiment. It's never as tidy as this. This was just before photo shooting. So don't believe any what anything of what you see. Um, um, I mean, we, 
it's just full with prototypes and trials. Many of those ideas never go anywhere, but sometimes they do. We also have a dog. Her name is Ami. You can see her underneath the sofa. Uh, she tried to be involved in everything. Whatever we, she, we do, she really have to stick her little black nose. Um, and sometimes she's a bit doubtful, but, you know, she had to cope. Um, um, yeah, maybe I would just show you some of our processes, the way we develop ideas and some of the end results. Um, and this is an experiment we play. Again, I just put lots of quadrat objects because I knew Andres gonna be here. You know? um, so this is where you guys celebrated the Hellingdahl. Uh, how many years was it? Like that's about 10 years ago, something like that. So instead of weaving, uh, they sent us the samples to the studio and we started to break the fabric apart because woven fabric, it's quite easy. You cut the edge and then you start pulling out the thread and you started to create pattern within existing fabric. And because it's often done with two colors, it was so beautiful to see what happened when you pull. And then we started to see how we can maybe weave two layers together. It was super nice process. So we just, this is a good example because we just got those beautiful fabric. We started to kind of break to go into the DNA of the, of the material. And somehow it's end up with this chair uh, that Moroso uh, produced for them for a time. And it was it was really nice, nice process. Again, we often when we walk, we try with something that we find fascinating without knowing where it's gonna end. So when we got those textile and started to pull fabric, we didn't know it's gonna end up uh, with a chair, but because of the fact that it's woven in 90, in 90 degrees, um, it has to be linear. And this pattern for this armchair was linear too, even though it looks quite curved and three-dimensional, when you look at the pattern, it's absolutely flat. Um, uh, so as I say already, Yael is really fascinated by uh, geometry and often uh, she spent a day and she just folds stuff. And we were thinking how we can actually take those qualities of little paper model that sometimes the magic always lost when you turn it into a finished project. And how can you take those little beautiful crunkle, um, crumple pieces of paper and keep this um, kind of innocent feel? And, and we def developed a system where we uh, fold paper into structural elements, almost like packaging. And then instead of covering it, uh, instead of filling it with foam, or as you usually do upholstery, you have wooden structure, foam, and then upholstery. Here we did it the other way around. So it's paper that folded, and then we fill it with foam that expand inside. And the result is um, structural chair you can sit on. And because the foam react within the shell, it creates a sprinkle that are unpredictable. Um, so you get those kind of um, different structure. Every chair looks different. We develop it also with veneer. So instead of paper, we folded veneer. And um, this is a project we developed for Capellini at the time. Uh, I mean, that was really hard uh, production piece because there is a tricky bit. When you have a great idea, experimental idea in the studio, it's fine. But when you start selling this all over the world, uh, it's it's a different story. The problem with this project is, is the foam is keep walking. No matter how, it never fully set. So let's say you go to the shop, you buy this really expensive stool from Capellini, and then five months later, it just keeps shrinking and shrinking. And then at one point, we started to get the royalty report from Capellini, and we see that we actually get minus royalties. So we own the money. How is it possible? And then we realize that, um, you know, when you buy a stool and it keeps shrinking in your living room, uh, not everyone is happy about it. Um, but you know, we're playing around. Um, another project that we did um, after college was this one, which is uh, challenging the, the common structure of a chest of drawers. So if you think about chest of drawers, it's always like you have a box and if you have those elements in between. And myself that love move, movement so much and um, um, principles and technical details, I mean, chest of drawers is like a heaven for me because 
you know, you have a movement, you have movement, you have to move something in order to use it. It's not like a um, seat element. And we developed this uh, project where you have hidden structure. And when you move the, um, uh, the drawers, it just, people don't get what's happened. How can you move it? How does it not fall? Um, and from this experiment that we start in movement, we developed this product for establishing sound that is uh, still in production. And um, it's just a collection of colorful uh, panels that hiding structure and, and that moves and it's almost like a living uh, sculpture because whenever you use it, it just take a different, different shape and form. Um, another project is Pivot that you mentioned before. Uh, again, we wanted to challenge the common structure of chess of drawers. We developed it for Alco. It's a Dutch company where 150 years ago started by building uh, sewing machine boxes. So there again, movement and expansion, uh, that's part of the DNA. So it really fits the, um, the collection. Um, and again, the idea of expanding and changing shape is, is or layers is something we uh, often love to explore. This is a chair uh, for Louis Vuitton and they started the Objet Normand collection. It's a furniture collection about, uh, I would say something like 12 years ago. And then they approach us and say, okay, um, we are famous brand, but we wanna um, add some furniture to our collection. It was experiment. They were not sure if they wanna have it a commercial or just a concept or PR element. Um, but the idea is travel, it's a dream. And obviously, no one thought that we're gonna design a chair that you're gonna go climb the Everest and take a Louis Vuitton chair with you. But the idea of um, expanding was really appealing to us. Often, you know, you buy those folded stool or folded chairs, the, the, the aim or the ambitions of the company is to make it as small as possible. And you're like, okay, let's do a foldable chair. Let's make it like really grand when you open it. So that's the chair when it's uh, folded and this is when it's open. And um, it's all started again with those uh, little models that you love uh, playing around with. Why do I need to press it this way? Again, like it's so easy when you um, when you help think about the geometry and how to make it expand when it's done in paper. But it took four years to make it into a real chair keep the character, make it comfortable. Uh, this is me on the way to the Everest. Um, um, this is the lights that is part of the same collection. And then some of the ways we work is that we develop principles, uh, almost like artists in studio, without having an aim. So let's say when we develop these shapes out of paper, it's just because yeah, I had this kind of geometric idea in her head and she had to try it. And that can stay on the shelf for like two weeks, two years, until until we know where it's gonna go. So we don't sit in the studio and say, we need to develop a new table for Louis Vuitton. We just play around. And when something really attract, you know, sometimes you just go to the bin, sometimes you stay on the shelf. Uh, in this case, uh, we just kind of keep playing in it, see what possibility, where can it go, and and our collection with our connection with Louis Vuitton is growing with the years because the fact that they work with leather, which is very similar to paper in the qualities, allow us to um, uh, have this kind of intimate relationship with the brand where you show them ideas and they understand the quality of that, and you believe it, they believe in it. And that's a table we uh, later um, uh, showed with them. It's it's again, when you start with a paper model, you need to work really, really hard to develop a product that is functional, it's durable, it's made in perfect quality, and it still doesn't lose the charm. So that's, that's the element we were kind of dealing with. Um, Another experiment or geometrical experiment is this project of, this is really hard word, word to pronounce, step head on, which is a geometrical shape, which is symmetric, but then you cut it in the middle and you turn it. And from 
whatever reason, we had this kind of fascination with this. In a way, if you think about tennis ball, is it a little bit like that? Because you have two, um, two symmetrical elements that are turned 90 degree. And during COVID, there was not much to do, just to play with a, no workshop, no studio, just some paper and a printer. Uh, we were playing with just how can you interpret a tennis ball into um, into a paper st structure? Because no matter how you look at it, it's really curvy. And we thought about how can we um, take this beautiful, almost perfect uh, structure and, and make it out of paper? Uh, don't ask us why. It just was interest. Um, and then we did like lots of models and lots of trials, and um, some of them are this. And when I saw Yael walking on this one, I was like, okay, are you making a new chair? And she was like, where do you see a chair? And I was like, obviously it's a chair. And and we thought, okay, okay, let's let's uh, let's develop it into something bigger. And again, we expand um, the sizes, started to see uh, where can it go, and um, play with foam as well. And um, that's the end results. That's uh, again a, a project we uh, presented with Louis Vuitton. Again, the front bit is quadrat. It's um, combination of leather and stretchable velvet. I don't remember the name of the product, but it's brilliant. It was also really fun to match the colors that the velvet um, is available with the colors of uh, the leather we found at Louis Vuitton. Uh, but we did need some stretchable fabric because we couldn't achieve the seat uh, unless it was stretchable. Um, and also the sofa. Um, ah, that's after Milan, we got back and there was a leak in our studio. So that's what happened when water meet paper. But you know, uh, that's part, part, part of the story when, when you work with material. Um, so paper, paper is something we always interested. Geometry is something we always kind of, uh, ch check or go back to. It's our comfort zone. Um, this is a project that we developed for tile company Mutina uh, when they asked us to design a tile. I mean, that's also quite a long time ago. And we were like, we see ourselves as three-dimensional designers. We like objects, we like, you know, um, material. What, what can you add to a tile, which has to be so flat? Um, so, I mean, the first thing uh, we start to do is like folding paper, and pouring uh, plaster into the folds. Um, it's just creating patterns uh, out of um, out of uh, folding paper. And I, I think at the time, I remember we went to see the fair in Bologna and you see so many different ties. And I think the ties industry is so driven by trends. Um, and every year you can find this kind of, what's the current trend at the time it was ties that look like wood. That was what everywhere you go, you see tiles that fake timber or tile that fake concrete. It's always trying to be something else. And we thought, okay, if we are doing tiles like fake paper, which is just the most, I don't know, uh, pure, simple, available material ever. And also we like this kind of contrast or like imaginary story where you take a shower and you're surrounded by paper all around you. Um, so this was our first collection for Mutina. The second was, uh, uh, we call it text, is where we, for some time, we walk with plasticine or clay everywhere and we just kept stealing texture from everywhere we've been. So we would walk around, it was kind of texture research. We would just stick a piece of plasticine and just steal the texture from whatever building, Texture, textile, uh, flooring, pavement. And then we had a huge collection of different texture in the studio. It's, uh, yeah, we kind of copy paste, but three dimensional. And uh, when we show it to, um, to Mutina, they really liked this idea. And we collected, we created this collection of uh, texture, text, texture that we stole from different textile. None of them are quadrat, just, there is Ikea, but uh, 
no quadrat. Um, and then we developed this tag collection. So you can see there is canvas, um, uh, kitchen towel, um, herringbone trousers. Uh, no, this herringbone suit. This is corduroy um, and this collection of, of tiles that called Dex tile. That's the, the name. Um, um, again, this idea of playing around with your dimensional elements, even if you create something flat like a carpet. So we've been asked to design a carpet uh, for Italian brand Golran. We really wanted to have a flat woven kill him um, rug, but because that was the trend at the time, everyone was doing flat woven. We want to do flat woven, but they were insisting it has to be woven as a pile, thick uh, rug because they have this huge know-how uh, where they produce those beautiful rug. And like, we really didn't want to do a pile rug, um, but they, they said, guys, if you want to work with us, you have to do a pile rug. And we thought, okay, how can we use the fact that it's pile? It's not flat woven. How can we play with it? How can we make something that it hasn't been done? And um, we play with this lenticular art where you have like a zigzag surface and one side, it looks one thing from the other side is it look another thing. So as you see here in the photo, it's a paper model where, you see a, a, a plain rug for one side, but it's reflect on the mirror, uh, colorful. So we did a, they did a quick model, uh, just to see if the weavers can actually do this zigzag element in a woven rug, and they manage, and that was really exciting because what what happened with the rug that looks like that is not that from one side it looks plain and from the other side it's colorful. It's actually ever changing. So from every angle that you walk around, it looks different, and it's almost like a living, um, a living uh, object. So then we eventually took the final patterns from a flat woven from a classic kilim, and we applied on um, on a pile rug with this zigzag element, and um, that's that's the final results where you can see from one side is colorful, from the other side is plain, and it's. Uh, yeah, um, and it looks really ever different from any any angle. Um, this idea of pattern is ongoing in our um, interest and research. Here, for instance, we develop um, uh, a project where we dip planks in a stain, in a wood dye in 45 degrees. And then we keep dipping it in different uh, colors and we create layers um, that end up in like uh, patterns. Uh, of course, you can do it also in other materials, as I'm gonna see. But here was the idea: how you take like a very basic principle, like tilting bucket with stain, dipping it, and how do you create a collection out of it? Uh, we did this exhibition in Milan where we presented our ideas, our collection, uh, but. We also let visitors to come and play. It was really nice to see the reaction of how people react when they let uh, the opportunity uh, to play around as well. Um, I'm not sure I have images of there, but it wasn't as nice as ours. But still, it was nice to see um, how people love the opportunity to, to play. Um, of course, we kept playing with that. We dipped uh, in folded paper just to see what happened when you dip a folded paper into a die. And then we expanded into more three-dimensional elements because it's nice if you dip uh, a cylinder, you get those really nice curves. It's not as flat as just a simple plank. And then uh, we expanded it to um, elements um, and um, uh, this is at the Vitra house uh, at the loft in Germany. Um, uh, so I don't know if you had a chance to visit uh, the Vitra campus. It's this kind of heaven of design. Uh, where you go there uh, is the museum and the showroom and um, some of the offices of the company are still there. Uh, um, so they have the loft above this Herzog de Moron beautiful pile building and they change the loft every two years. And they ask us to come up with an idea and to design the interior of, of the place. Um, 
and they say we really love when whoever get a project because they've done it a few times before that they invent like someone who come and live there like a creative person a photographer or like a story and then when Yael and I were thinking about why do you need to invite someone else a create is to invent another creative person that come and live there why won't we just say we are in inviting ourselves to live at the loft for two years and how would it look like if we were to leave them so as a family with two kids as a family that or like two creative people that like to deep color we kind of created this living space which is also like a workshop so you see let's say this is a whole hanging cushion that we dip in the bathtub and then we had this obsession of just dipping any wood element and ceramics everything that basically can absorb um uh, color uh, so it's wood textile ceramics uh so it was alongside um vitra product it was uh um um yeah the, the installation of colors we even invited Marge simpson to join us she's having a bath right now um and um and as a result uh of it that's some of the images of the process uh, in our studio. And then uh, as a result, um, some of the elements have been added to the accessories collection at Vitra. So this wooden decoration and some, um, some cushion as well. This is some trials um, and that's the end result. And this, kind of idea of when you start with a process um, that you don't know how you're going to end up with, it's it's really essential because I don't think if Vitra would come to us and say, can you please design a cushion for us? I don't know where we would start. I mean, how could, there's this amazing cushion for our Girard for like probably 50 years. How can you make something more beautiful than this? And I think when you go through a process um, and then it's in a way the process leads its way and we find it easier to come up with, with ideas. Um, and the final project I'm going to talk about is something we call 2D, 3D, which is a long uh, project that uh, we run alongside a collaboration with, with Brands. It's a in-house project that we do every now and again. And it's all started with the installation we did in 2009 in Basel at Design Miami. We've been awarded the Design of the Future. It's a big uh, title, but um, uh, we got a brief to create an installation that has plaster and reflection. In their head, they were more imagining the classic Parisian ballroom in the 19th century, where you have those plastic decoration in the ceiling and everything is covered with mirrored. Uh, but we thought, okay, Forget about that. We had a wallpaper at home with like Swiss mountain, like one of those cheesy um, wallpaper that you have sometimes. And you see this beautiful mountain with a reflection on the lake. The exhibition gonna be in Basel. So it's okay, we have to translate this cheesy wallpaper into something um, uh, real. And we thought, okay, the, the project has to, the material has to include plaster and, um, and reflection. I thought instead of decorative plaster, let's use just plaster boards, which is the most available plaster nowadays. Uh, we created a mountain out of plaster boards. And then the reflection is from a really, really polished parquet floor that inspired by a bowling floor, where you see this really, really re reflective surfaces. Um, again, the idea here was instead of uh, using simple parquet, let's dye the parquet, create a pattern to achieve this kind of typical landscape in Switzerland. And, you know, we walk so hard on this mountain, like you spend most of the effort, this floor maybe took like three days to install, but then the reaction for the floor was so amazing that again, like we would never be able to predict something uh, unless, and just you just try out. And uh, we've been invited to, um, um, to this uh, gallery in, in um, London, where the guy asked us to just, create a floor for the, for the gallery and just not show anything else. They usually show a uh, limited edition pieces of furniture. And it was like, no, let's just do the floor. And it was really nice concept for us uh, just to present the floor in a gallery. Uh, the pattern came from a scarf uh, we had because if you zoom in into woven 
um, a woven piece of textile like this, you see that the herringbone is not very different from a wooden herringbone flooring. So it was really easy to copy the pattern from a woven textile and move it into a woven floor. And um, Stella McCartney came to the openings. She saw it and she was like, oh my God, I have to have it. I'm going to open a shop in Milan uh, next year and I really want to have this floor. And often when you have openings, you meet people and you think, oh my God, uh, I met this guy and that guy. Then like a few days after you wait for the email, nothing happened. But here, here she was really serious. She was like, oh my God, Stella McCartney won the floor. And so we developed this uh, floor for her. We put lots of little number on Illustrator so the people who make the floor can know which tiles to position. Um, and, it, and it happened. And the flow was like, this is, I think, 2009. I think it's become quite a huge trend after with all these kind of herring moons. And nowadays it's almost impossible to see it anymore. But at the time it was quite new and people really came to the floor, to the store, just to see the floor installation. And um, so the branding manager just decided that all the floor, the coming stores would have to use our floor. And the, I think the Gucci, group bought Stella McCartney at that time and they decided to open 40 stores globally including China's there is sign Shanghai and um, we've been really lucky to be in this right time at the right moment uh, and and uh, just to design different floors so this is like Stockholm uh, just this is in Madrid or in Barcelona Barcelona I think and it was really fun project just to kind of see how you get the layout. We do like a few sketches uh, to kind of support the, I don't know, the, the, the flow in the space uh, and just create patterns. Um, I mean, there was, that's in Las Vegas. Yeah, and there was one issue with this floor is that usually in the entrance because the dye is just sitting on the surface. So it would fade away after a year or so. So they will have to come and mask each block and repaint it was just a headache and we were thinking how can we find a way to get the dye into the timber i mean we we didn't want to do it for them because we already did these 40 stores they move on i mean um but there has this interest of how can you get a dye to go into the core of the timber it's only a little bit like you know in when you go to venice and you have those guys trying to sell you blue roses these cheesy white roses that they put in blue water and they all become blue. And you think like, why would I want to have blue roses? So this is what we try to achieve here. Um, so we play around with different type of timber and different type of processes. And with this idea to get the color in. Um, and it was kind of long process that we kind of spend time every now and again without deadlines, without any clear idea where it's going. And eventually we manage, uh, we use this typical uh, poplar timber in a kind of heating, boiling and vacuum process. And the color is fully going inside. And the beauty is that when you slice it, you can never know how the color gonna look from inside. So you have this gradation and different variation of tones. It's all to do with how much wax and oil there is in the timber or humidity. Um, and then we developed this huge uh, collection of colors. Um, and all of this without actually knowing where it's going. Then once we achieve this color collection, it's okay, what are we doing now with that? And then we started laminating and shaping that. And we realized you ever have this object that are with laminated uh, colors and then you sculpture and then you get results. But we thought that we want to get something into more interesting and we discovered that if you laminate a piece of wood in 45 degrees and then you uh, shape it, you get those really intricate, complex um, lines. And I thought for us, this is interesting. Let's let's take it further. So we started laminating and coloring the veneers and um, starting a full production in the studio of colored wood and timber, which all um, end up uh, as blocks like this. Um, and when we put all these blocks together into bigger um, structures and uh, we using CNC, then you start revealing the colors and then start revealing the shapes. Um, 
and it was always fascinating to send a block to the CNC and then get the result. And we were always laughing. That could be a big carnival for hamsters because they can just play around in colorful sawdust. Um, but that's that's a collection of furniture that we developed that we call end grain um, because the color come from the end grain into the timber. Uh, is the bench. Um, uh, and then we could just, just kept exploring, creating different shapes, um, different elements, um, different color combination. It's really labor intensive. It's a crazy project. It takes about half a year to make a bench. But the nice bit about this project is every stage is fascinating and it looks amazing on every stage. So even when we do this, we think it's so shame to send this beautiful block and to kind of make it more clean after. But this is part of the process and this is the end result. Um, so I don't know which which you prefer before the CNC or after. Um, um, there is a lot of waste in this. So we always thought, how what can we do with the um, leftover? So we did some uh, uh, jar tops. Uh, this was the collection of colors at the time in our studio. And the final part that we did with this, um, uh, project is in Chatsworth House in England. It's a Duke house where uh, the Duke and Duchess are collecting art for about 500 years. So when you go there, you see pieces from nowadays, like absolutely contemporary to sculptures from the Renaissance. In their view, they were always collecting contemporary art, but because they do it for so many generations, it just mixed together. Um, so they have the sculpture gallery and they ask us to design something with this end, end grain collection. And with our fascination of flooring and timber, we thought, okay, maybe we can get a bit of inspiring with all those beautiful garden that they have outside the palace and get like a flow where the pieces of furniture are growing from the floor. Um, and that was our proposal. Um, so we started to play around with surfaces and how uh, timber can, how benches can grow from a floor uh, with continuous patterns and colors. And that was the end result. Um, it was there for about a year where a visitor could just have a seat and look at the sculptures. Um, and um, that's the Duke and Duchess at the opening night. Um, it was crazy to see four people sitting on a bench, but it was fine. Um, and um, yeah, now we are developing the final, I mean, the next, uh, I would say, stage of this Engren project. But now because we get older and we can't cook wood anymore ourselves, we find a supplier in Italy that does it for us. And um, we're now focusing on blue and dark, uh, black almost, and white, and we're creating those cooked wood in a much bigger scale. We are working on a new collection uh, that already in four years in the making, so hopefully it should be ready uh, in coming month. So uh, when this is ready, I would be more than happy um, to share photos with you. Uh, but that's it. Thank, thanks very much, everyone.